I really appreciate it. Um, I'll start hopefully slowly. And uh, if I'm too slow and this is all things you know, just let me know, uh, but hopefully this will be good. So this is joint work with Greg Blackerman and Mohit Singh who are both at Georgia Tech and Rekha Thomas who is at the University of Washington. Um, so yeah, I want to tell you a little bit about graph density inequality, sums of squares and tropicalizations. And to start, I thought we would do math together. So uh, if you have a piece of paper close by, I, I would like you to draw a graph on seven vertices, any graph. And then I want you to count how many edges there's in your graph and how many triangles. So for example, I'm drawing this graph, which has nine edges and two triangles. So everybody draw one. And then when you're done, either in the chat, put how many edges you had and how many triangles or just annotate straight uh, within uh, the graph where you are. So I am at, let's put another color, nine, two. Oh, guys, do it. Annie insists. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. Alexander has the same number of edges and triangles as I did. Um. Yeah, I don't see how to do this on the chat. Is, are other people having trouble? I guess not. <laughs> Uh, well, you can just tell me, Tony, how many you have, and I can just plot it. Oh, okay. I'm still doing it. <laughs> so Yuval has seven and four. I put it in. Uh, but yeah, you can also annotate by yourself. There's a little button up on your screen if you want, or chat is okay. fine. Cynthia has 10 and 2. Alexander has 14 and 7. Al has 7 and 0. Robert has 10 and 2. 7 and 0. Some people are finding the same graphs. Maybe. I have 12 and 0. 12 and 0, Abby? Yeah, I sent it, I think. Wow. Tigger doesn't like your answer, Ovi. <laughs> <laughs> Since she's putting us through all this trouble, you have to, you know, counterattack. <laughs> so, you know, may maybe people can keep annotating. Um, but so we, we get some points, right? And you could think, you could do this for any graph. And you could think, what would the closure of all these points look like? Okay, so this is called a graph profile. And so instead of asking you the number of edges and triangles, I could ask you about densities instead. Both are interesting problems. Uh, and so now I just want to be a bit precise because there's different ways of counting, right? So for example, if instead of asking you triangles, I had asked you to find the number of passive length two in your graph, then you could have said, well, maybe I count this as a path of length two, or maybe I don't, right? Do I count induced graphs or subgraphs? And then would I count, could I send both of my edges to the same edge or not? Again, you know, so there's different ways of counting. So let's look at different ways of counting just so that we're all on the same page. So there's a subgraph density. So the subgraph density is for some, the most intuitive, for others, it's the induced density. So for the subgraph density, I look at all the injective maps that send edges to edges. And I divide by all possible injective maps from the vertex set of my smaller graph to the vertex set of my target graph, which here I'm calling G. So OK, how many injective maps are there in total from the vertex set of my path of length 2 to my the vertex set of my graph G? Well, I have three vertices here. My first vertex can go to four places, my second vertex to three places, and my last vertex to two places. So four times three times two, that makes 24. So there's 24 injective maps. And now out of these 24 injective maps, I want to think how many are actually um, sending edges to edges. So, okay, I want to send that edge and that edge. I can send it 
let's say like, like this here, or I could go like this. And you know, like if I wanted to be really nice, I could say, well, I need to actually be very careful because you know, maybe this edge goes like this and this edge goes like this or vice versa. I could go like this and like this, right? Uh, so if I'm careful in how I count, I'll see that there's 16 maps out of my 24 maps that send edges to edges. Now I could do the same thing, but the induced way. So the induced way, I want to make sure that I send non-edges to non-edges. So I don't want, just want to send edges to edges, I want to send non-edges to non-edges. So for example, um, I wouldn't be able to send my edges in this way. So this would not be okay because I have an edge between my two end vertices here, whereas here I don't. So this would not count as a map. So really the only maps that work is um, I could send it, for example, this way would work. So this one would work, for example. And now I could flip the pink and the green, and then I could do it symmetrically and start from the bottom left vertex instead. So there's only four of the maps that remain for the induced way. And so finally, the last way of counting is the homomorphism density. And that's the one we're going to use. They're all related. I'm going to tell you why in a second. But really, the homomorphism density is the one that you want to remember. So for the homomorphism density, I am taking all the maps going from the vertex set of my smaller graph to the vertex set of my, uh, my target graph. So here, each vertex can go to any of the four vertices of G. So I have 4 times 4 times 4 maps in total. So I have 64 maps. And now I want to send edges to edges, right? It's a homomorphism. So all of the maps that I found for the subgraph density, so those 16 maps, they're still good. But now I also have the option of sending, um, let's say, my both of my edge edges to one edge. So for example, I could send my edge like this and like this, that would be fine. And I could do it upside down too. So for each edge of G, I'm going to have two extra maps that are going to come from it. So I'm going to have the 16 previous maps plus 10. So I'm at 26 maps. Are there any questions about the different ways of counting? OK. So in, in the last I mean, one, you just saw your three vertices at random, and you just see whether you see your graph or not. Uh, more than seeing, right? Because I can send my, both of my edges to one yeah, edge. Yeah. See, okay. That's consistency. That, that's seeing. Okay. Seeing yeah. <laughs> is consistency of edges. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So as long as edges go to edges, I'm happy. Uh, but they can go on the same edge. That's fine. And so, um, so they're all related. Um, so the subgraph density is basically the same thing as the induced density, it's just a Mobius transformation away. And the subgraph density and the homomorphism density, if you're looking at target graphs where the number of vertices goes to infinity, they're really recording the same thing. So as the number of vertices in G goes to infinity, the difference between them goes to zero. So asymptotically, all of these things are equivalent. Um, the homomorphism density is kind of nicer because we'll be able to use it for finite graphs. All the results I'm going to tell you are going to hold for the other two. You just need to either add, you know, um, well, for target graphs or the number of versus goes to infinity. And, you know, if you're looking at the induced density, then you have to do a transformation to really get the same statement. But everything is tied together. So we'll, we'll use the homomorphism density. Questions before we look at the graph profile that we were just looking at in terms of densities? All right, so let's define graph profile 
formally. So let's say that I have a collection of small graphs, H1 through HL. Then I'll say that the graph profile of this collection of graph is going to be the closure of all the vectors recording the homomorphism density of my smaller graphs within some graph G, right? And so I, I take the closure of all these vectors for all graphs. So that's exactly what we were doing when we were doing math collectively together, right? But now it's in terms of densities. So here is what I get. This was proven to be the correct picture by Hasbohov in 2008. So I have the edge density at the bottom, my triangle density uh, on the y-axis. And so, for example, if you know a little bit of extremal graph theory, there's Mantel's theorem, right? That says that if you have no triangles in a graph, that the maximum edge density is one half, right? So you see Mantel's theorem right here on the x-axis. Um, you might know Turin graphs, so k-partite graphs that are that have equal parts. So these are these graphs. So this is a complete bipartite graph with equal parts, complete tripartite graphs with equal parts, four partite graphs, and so on. And so it just keeps going. There's more of these little scallopy bits. Uh, so this is a really cool picture. We don't know these pictures very well. We only know a few of them for pairs of graphs. So we know if you have an edge and a complete graph, those we know. We know if you have any two graphs on three vertices, we know that. And that's about it. We don't know graph profiles in any case when you have three graphs, right? So for example, I could say, okay, on the Z axis, add you know the density of a complete graph on four vertices. What does that look like? We don't know, no idea. We don't know any graph profile in more than two dimensions and two dimensions, yeah, we know stunningly little. So, well, Oh, look for it very well, sorry. What about if you have an edge and a an square, that thing? An edge and a square, we don't know that. So yeah, in, in, for, in, for edge, we know edge and a complete graph. And edge and a path of length too. And that's it. <laughs> we know stunningly little. We don't even know that these shapes should be almost everywhere differentiable, or that they should be the you know countably union of many algebraic surfaces or anything like that. We really don't know how bad it gets. Um, but in some cases, like this is kind of nasty already. I mean, I think it's very beautiful, but it's kind of complicated, right? And it's already just an edge and a triangle, which you cannot really go simpler than that. Uh, but so here, for example, we see, okay, well, we have some inequalities that come from it. So I'm, I'm losing the T here for homomorphism density. When I put a little graph, I really mean just a homomorphism density of that graph to be evaluated in some graph G that I don't know, right? I really think of it as a function that if I were to evaluate it on any graph G, this would hold. So this is saying that if I were to take the homomorphism density of an edge within some graph G and I cubed that and I took away the homomorphism density of a triangle and squared that within that same graph G, I would always get zero, right? So this is how to interpret this inequality. You, you get at least zero, not- I get at least zero, sorry, yes. Thank you, Abby. Um, so I do have some inequalities like this. And e even if, you know, I I don't know how bad these shapes are, you know, I can still try to understand what inequalities, what polynomial inequalities involving homomorphism densities are true on these graph profiles, right? And so really most problems in extremal graph theory can be thought of as um, certifying the validity of some inequality involving uh, graph density inequalities. So how do I certify these guys? Uh, so from the title, you might guess that I want to use sums of squares. So I know that some of you know sums of squares really well. I don't know if that's the case for everybody, so I'll go through a few important results of sums of squares for real polynomials, and then we'll translate that to the case of homomorphism densities. Any questions about what is a graph profile or densities before we look at sums of squares? All right, so let's go on. If there were questions, they would be asked. It's just very clear. <laughs> 
Well, Yuval, maybe you had a question, actually. Yeah, so if you don't uh, take the closure, can you say more about the set? If, if I what? Sorry. If you don't take the closure. If I don't take the closure. Oh, if I don't take the closure, then it's uh, it's a mess. <laughs> if I don't take the closure, then I really would not be able to tell you much. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's even worse. All right. So let's talk for a minute about some of the squares in the world of real polynomials. So if I have a real polynomial, I say that it's non-negative if I evaluate it on any point of Rn and get at least zero. Right, so for example, here, this polynomial in x and y, I see on whatever x, y I evaluated, I get at least zero. Then I say that a polynomial is a sum of squares if I can write this polynomial as a sum of finitely many squares of polynomials. And so since the square of a polynomial is non-negative, that means that a sum of squares is non-negative. So I think of sums of squares as a certificate of non-negativity. Right, so for example, if I were to ask you, is this polynomial here non-negative? Well, maybe you would be able to tell me yes or no after doing a little bit of work, but it, it would take you more than a second. Whereas if I rewrite this polynomial like this, then all of a sudden you're just like, oh, well, yes, this is non-negative, right? Because I have a square that's non-negative plus a square, non-negative plus one, which is also a square, non-negative. So, really sums of squares allow me to give certificates of validity for some inequalities, which is great. The sad news is that we cannot always do that, right? So Helbert in 1888, this gentleman here, showed that not all non-negative polynomials are sums of squares, all right? So this is an old result. And after this, Helbert, as his 17th problem asked, well, maybe this was asking too much, right? So what if we relax to having sums of rational functions squared. Would that work? Would I be able to write all non-negative polynomials in that way? So this was proven to be true in 1927 by Arten, uh, this gentleman, who showed that yes, every non-negative polynomial can be written as a sum of squares of rational functions. And so it actually took a while for Hilbert, uh, for, for, to, to find an example of Hilbert's theorem, right? So Hilbert's proof was not constructive. And so it took until 1967 for Mutzkin with the help of Olga Tusky Todd to find an example of a non-negative polynomial that is not a sum of squares, which is actually the polynomial that I plotted up there. And so just to be clear from Arjun's theorem, we do know that this is going to be a, um, I can write it as a sum of squares of rational functions. And so one way to see it is to see that if I multiply m of xy by x squared plus y squared plus one, then this expression I can write as a sum of squares. And so then I'm fine. So this is a very brief overview of um, sums of squares in the world of real polynomials. So now I want to see how does this translate to the world of uh, graph homomorphism inequalities. So I'll call a sum of squares of polynomials involving graph densities a graph sum of squares. And so the first thing that we have is the equivalent result of uh, Hilbert's, right? So uh, Hatami and Nahin in 2011 showed that not every non-negative graph polynomial can be written as a graph sum of squares. So that's not too surprising. What's more surprising is that it did show that uh, Artin's result does not hold. So not every non-negative graph polynomial can be written as a rational graph sum of squares. So that's a first big difference. So then you might wonder, well, are these graph sums of squares even a good tool for these polynomial inequalities involving graph densities? And well, we do know that if you're willing to go approximately, they're very good. So Lovas and Segeri and Nesser Tom showed that every non-negative graph polynomial plus any epsilon greater than zero can actually be written as a graph sum of squares. So if you're willing to go approximately, not a problem. Graph sums of squares work fine. And so just like in the case of uh, real polynomials, the hatami uh proof was not really constructive. And so there wasn't any example uh, of these statements. And so in 2008, 
Greg, uh, Rekha, Mohit, and me, we showed some examples. And so here is the simplest example that we found of something that is a non-negative graph polynomial that cannot be written as a graph sum of squares. So if I look at the homomorphism density of a path of length three with an any graph G minus the homomorphism density of three disjoint edges within uh, the same graph G, that is non-negative. That's always greater or equal to zero, but I cannot write it as a sum of squares. And so later we showed the same is true for a rational graph sum of squares. I cannot do it with a rational graph sum of squares either. So for the rest of the talk, I want to kind of show you a little bit, how did we come up with that? And so basically we, we, we showed exactly which graph polynomials that only involve uh, graphs on with three edges can be written as graph sum of squares. So we understand that fully. And this guy is not one of them. And for the rational part, we looked at trapezoidalizations of the sets of points that sums of squares accept to do that. So hopefully I'll have time to touch on both, but certainly I should be able to show you what does a graph sum of squares actually look like, right? Because it might not be completely clear yet. Annie? Yes. So like the usual example, not for graphs, the Motskin polynomial. Can you say a word as to why that, like, yeah, I guess that can't be morphed into a graph polynomial. Oh, so, so that again, Tony, the Motskin polynomial, what? It's called Motskin polynomial, the classic example of something that can't be done as a sum of squares, but it's not a graph polynomial. Yeah. So, so, so do, do you mean, what if I replace my X and Y's with graphs? Yeah, it doesn't work, I guess. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yeah, we did we did look at that at some point, and and you're right, it just it would be a more complicated expression there, right? So we, we did find more examples than just this one, uh, but there, it's not guaranteed. It will depend on what graphs you take. So for certain graphs, you might get uh, a sum of squares. So the rules are a bit different in how things cancel than with uh, normal bell polynomials. So, like the first result. The, the non-constructive one, that's, uh, I guess, so it's a, so this must not work. I mean, it's even hard to get, it's even work to prove this non-constructively, I guess. Uh, Hilbert proof? No, no, so you said before your paper, I think what you said was, yeah, the Hatami, yeah, so they give a non-constructive proof. But I'm just saying that, uh, so I guess just plugging in, yeah, there's no, no easier way to do it the way I was describing it. Yeah, so, I mean, so they do, Maybe saying that it's non-constructive is a bit mean in their case. So you could, you could create a monster, uh, a monstrous thing there uh, for uh, the non-negative uh, one that cannot be written as a graph sum of squares. Okay. For the rational one, you couldn't. Want, but yeah, so there there is a trick that you could use some results from. Uh, from uh, real polynomials and algebraic geometry and create something quite quite monstrous, but nothing that you would ever encounter in nature. And then for the rational one, they couldn't do that. I think Tony was, if I understand correctly, Tony was just wondering if uh, you cannot just take something known in the polynomial world and just yeah. say, oh, this is also a graph density yeah. polynomial. Not directly, no. Yeah. Uh, because the rules are different, as we're going to see. Uh, so it's, yeah, it is. It is unfortunately more complicated than that. But that's that's a good idea. You know, that's the first thing that uh, yeah, I'm sure that Hatami and Nahin tried. More questions? Okay. So let's look at what some of the squares actually look like here. So. The first thing that we're going to need is um, understanding that we don't only want to look at homomorphism densities of unlabeled graphs. I also want to look at homomorphism densities of partially labeled graphs. Um, so let's say that my target graph is this one. And my target graph, I'm really thinking of it still as being unlabeled. I, I, I put labels in a sense just to distinguish the vertices, but there you're, you're really thinking of this as unlabeled. All that I mean by the labels is that um, in this case, for my 
smaller graph. That one is labeled and the labels is telling me exactly where those labeled vertices are going within my big graphs. So this vertex is going there and that one is going there. So I know where the labeled vertices of my smaller graph are going within my big graph. My unlabeled vertices can go anywhere. So my unlabeled vertex, let's say that it's green, can go either to one, two, three, four, five, or six, which again, they're, they're not really labeled. It's just to differentiate them. So there's six different places where it can go. And now I want to make sure that it goes to a place so that edges go to edges. So I could send it to three, right? So then I would have the edge one, three, and one, two, that works. I could send it to four. So I would have one, four, and one, two, that works. I could send it also to two, right? I mean, here again, I don't have to have uh, only injective maps. I can have any maps. So, okay, I can send it to two, but I cannot send it to one, five, or six. If I sent my green vertex to one, five, or six, then I don't get um, exactly the same graph as before, right? So if I send it to five, it sounds, maybe it works, but the middle vertex is my blue vertex and that's not okay. My middle vertex needs to be my big vertex. So these are my partially labeled graphs. And so from now on, again, I'll remove the T. I'll just keep the partially labeled graph to make the homomorphism density of that partially labeled graph within some graph G that I don't know. So it's some function. And why do I need partially labeled graphs? So if you know a little bit of representation theory, if I were to only use unlabeled graphs here to create my sums of squares, it's as if I would just be using the trivial representation. And so I would not be using the full decomposition, so using the full power of uh, sums of squares. So this is why I want to consider uh, sums of squares involving partially labeled graphs. Are there any questions about how the homomorphism density of a partially labeled graph works? Uh, I just wonder, are you going to mention uh, flag algebras and this uh, where it occurs naturally and fundamentally? Or oh, that's that's a good point, Avi. So I should have actually said that earlier when I was showing you the different types of densities. Uh, the induced density is flags, right? So flag algebras and induced densities, this is really what's going on. So again, all of our results are actually very related uh, just by this Mervius transformation. And so the next two tools we're going to see, um, you know, they're a bit different for flag algebras because of the Mervius transformation. And so it turns to turn to be simpler uh, in the case of amorphism density. So let me just say for those who don't know what uh, flag algebras are, it's a theory developed by Rasbol to study uh, basically homomorphism density and uh, uh, yeah, I, one can say much more and uh, certainly not on this point, but the um, introducing this partially labeled uh, homomorphism is an essential part there as well. So it's a natural one. Of course. Yeah. And so, yeah, so the, the picture that we saw, the original graph profile that we saw for edge and triangle that was proven by Hasbohov using uh, his flag algebras. So the next thing we need to know how to do is, well, okay, I'm going to be allowing for taking some of the squares involving partially labeled graphs, but in the end, the expression I'm going to be trying to certify is unlabeled. So I need to know how to unlabel and unlabeling is the same as symmetrizing. So when I put double brackets, double square brackets, I mean that I'm symmetrizing. So really this is a sum and I'm normalizing my sum. So I'm taking the, homomorphism density of this guy and then of, I changed, you know, to let's say um, one, three instead, and then two, three and so on for any two vertices within my um, target graph, I'm saying, okay, I'm fixing where these two vertices are going and I'm taking the density of that. And then I'm going to add them all up and normalize. So this is a sum normalized sum, that's all it is. And really in the end, what I'm doing is that I'm really looking at all the ways of sending any of the vertices everywhere. So I'm really going back to the unlabeled case by doing this. And then finally, the last thing that I need to know how to do is how to multiply, right? I'm taking a sum of squares, I need to square, which means I need to know how to multiply. So how does multiplication work? 
So multiplication here is very nice and simple. It's just gluing along vertices that have the same labels. If any edges get double, just keep one copy. So for example, if I were to take the homomorphism density of this um, partially labeled graph times the homomorphism density of this partially labeled graph, well, that would be the same thing as taking the homomorphism density of this partially labeled graph. So all I did is glued um, the, the vertices that have the same label. I removed the fact that there was a double edge created between one and three. And so this is where really the difference between the different types of densities show. If I were to look at induced densities, like in the case of flags, then this would be some complicated expression, somewhat complicated expression. Same thing with the unlabeling. Whereas for homomorphism densities, it's simple. If you think about subgraph densities, if you're looking at uh, target graphs where the number of vertices goes to infinity, then you get the same thing. Uh, you could get that, you know, the two unlabeled vertices could go to the same place. But if you're looking at a target graph where the number of vertices goes to infinity, well, the probability of that happening goes to zero. But so for homomorphism density, it's just very nice and simple. This is true whatever your target graph is, finite or not. Okay, so these are our three tools and now we're ready to see uh, some of squares. So just one second. Um, if you multiply things that have no labels, it will be a disjoint union. Yeah, exactly. Any more questions? All right, so let's show that the homomorphism density of a path of length two minus the homomorphism of two disjoint edges without, within any graph is always going to be greater or equal to zero. So this is my sum of square certificate. So I'm going to show that this is actually equal to my left-hand side. And so, as I said, you know, the symmetrization is really just a sum that I'm normalizing. So this is really an honest to God sum of squares. So first I square uh, my expression. So I know how to square. I take the square of the first term minus twice the cross product plus the square of the second term. Now I know how to multiply. I know that it just means gluing. Okay, so I'm gluing my two vertices that are labeled one. Here I have no vertices in common, so I just leave it be. And then I glue my two vertices that are labeled two. Symmetrizing really in the end just means removing labels. So, okay, I removed the labels. So my first and third term become the same. So I have two paths of length two and minus two times my cross product. So I have two disjoint edges. I take one half of that and I get my path of length two minus uh, my two disjoint edges. So this is a sum of squares proof that um, the homomorphism density of a path of length two minus the homomorphism density of two edges within any graph is going to be greater or equal to zero. Any questions about the sum of squares? So how good is this, right? So how good is this process, right? So we, we saw from uh, Hamid and Sergei that this will not always work. So why, why does it sometimes fail? What's a problem with them? So one of their weaknesses is either the lower, the, the lower uh, degree part of a graph, or for now, just let's think of a homogeneous non-negative graph polynomial. So homogeneous here means I'm, the degree of a term is going to be just a number of edges in that graph, okay? So if I look at a graph polynomial where all the graphs involved have the same number of edges, and I'm looking at a particular polynomial that can actually be written as a sum of squares, I don't know which, then what we can show is that if it can be written as a sum of squares, then it can be written in a very particular way. I know that it can be written in a way so that any two monomials in any given square multiply to have the same degree. What this is saying is that I won't be able to cancel things out with things of other degrees. Things have to work out immediately. If, they, if there is a way for it to work out, there is a way of magically canceling things within the same degree. And that's a very strong property, you know? So, uh, and so what is more, you know, like this is true, not just for homogeneous non-negative graph polynomials. It's also true 
for just in general, the lowest degree part of your polynomial. So if I look at the lowest degree part of my polynomial, I know that things will have to, you know, give me my lowest degree part by itself, everything that has degree V. That's why when you add this plus epsilon that Lovas uh, and Segeri and Nasser Tom talked about, you're adding something of degree zero. And so then all of a sudden, everything else will have the right to cancel out together. But right now, if you don't have this plus epsilon, you can't. And so, for example, then it becomes possible to actually think about, well, okay, can I give all the Grassmann squares of a certain degree? And so for, for degree three, it's very easy. We can do it for up to degree seven or eight, I think. And you know, if we coded it up, probably higher than that. Um, Sorry, so, yeah, I ask you a question. I think I'm getting really, a little... Um, so when you said so you don't mean do you, uh, do you mean just using those three rules or do you mean more generally? Yeah, uh, well, this is how some of the squares. These three rules allow you to um, understand some of the squares in general. Yes. So, so without loss of generality, any sum of squares, just use those three rules. Any sum of the squares. So I mean, this is all you need to know to make any sum of squares. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did that be obvious? <laughs> oh, I think I think if you took like 30 minutes to think about densities afterwards, they would be pretty obvious, yes. I mean, it, it does take a bit of time to get used to working with uh, with densities, but if, if you think about it a, a little bit, yeah, they, they're, they're pretty clear. Is it fair to think of the first one as like a restriction of the type of homomorphism counting? The second one is like a summing out or unrestriction and the third one is like an and like this this restriction in that one uh yeah so i mean definitely uh you know like yeah the symmetrization is a sum the, the the first one is yeah restricting your maps to only certain maps where you know where part of your map is going and the third one tells you how to glue so if you're setting you know if you have two maps how are they going to mix together mm -hmm. That, that's really, yeah, that's really all it is. Well, the middle one is not a sum, it's symmetrization. You are allowed to add squares, Tony. It's, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you can have more, okay. but the, the tool itself, the, the, the double bracket is a normalized sum. Yeah. It's really just why, uh, in, maybe in, uh, interpreting a question again. Uh, uh, yeah, she would like to see a proof system here. I mean, yeah, so yeah, exactly. I'm trying to figure out like the densities. About the axioms and the derivation rules of the, but maybe we can defer it. Okay, you can keep going, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, I, I see what you meant more to me. Yeah, we can talk about it after. Um, so, but but yeah, th th these are the tools to um, to think about your, your sums of squares. And so now with this extra rule where you know that your lowest degree part, you know, if there is, a proof for it, you know that there is a proof of that type where things don't cancel out, then it's, it's easy enough to say, okay, well, I know that I have, you know, these are the only graphs on three edges that exist. And I can think about what smaller graphs and partially smaller graphs can be multiplied together to give me something of degree three and when they're cross multiply to give me things of degree three and just write out all of the possible squares you could have. And there's really not many types. And so um, you can easily show that, OK, well, any sum of squares of degree three, so involving graphs only on three edges, will look something like this. And so now you can say, OK, well, what about if I want to know is a path of length three, <coughs> sorry, minus the homomorphism density of three disjoint edges as sum of squares? Well, can I have a one here and a minus one here and zeros everywhere else? And the answer is no. You cannot, you know, guarantee that this matrix is going to be PSD in that case. So, even if you add more of your path of length three, even if you make this more non-negative, right, it will never become a sum of squares. And so, this answered a question of Lovas. He had like this list of problems. Uh, so he asked this particular inequality. Uh, why is he interested in this particular inequality? It's called the blakely row inequality. It's um, a simple part of Sidorenko's conjecture, uh, which I'm going to tell you in a second. Even more is that it gave us an idea that, okay, maybe 
rational sum of the squares will be hard too. So certainly if I'm multiplying by one plus a sum of squares, so uh, I'm keeping the lowest degree part the same, this will still not be a sum of squares, right? So this was another question by Lovas. So this was a very specific type of rational sum of squares that he was asking for. And so we showed then, okay, this won't work. And with tropicalization, uh, we showed it even more. And we showed just in general. And so as I was saying, there's this uh, conjecture by Sidorenko, uh, who is here, um, that says that for any bipartite graph H, the homomorphism density of a graph H minus the homomorphism density of the number of edges in H disjoint edges is at least zero. So for example, right, this Blakely Roy inequality of a path uh, that has this form, right? A path is a bipartite graph, but this encompasses uh, way more inequalities and it's been open for a while now. And so certainly, you know, because we showed that the Blakely Roy didn't hold, it kind of shows that this is, some of those courts will not be able to solve this conjecture. And we also looked at the smallest open case of Sidorenko's conjecture. Um, and we showed that this is not a sum of squares. And so people had been wondering if some of the squares Cauchy-Schwartz method was the right way of proving um, Sidorenko's conjecture. And so we showed that, no, this is not a good tool because it is a homogeneous, it is about certifying a homogeneous inequality. And we just saw, this is hard. We, there's not a lot of play there. Things cannot cancel out. So there's not that many some of the squares in that world. Anne? Yes. Um, is the original uh, formulation of Sidorenko conjecture allows epsilon or doesn't allow epsilon? I mean, the, I mean, the original conjecture was just comparing it to a random graph where you would, or maybe you, you wouldn't mind. Yes, I'm just wondering what, uh, I mean, also the- so, so the problem with the epsilon is that, let's say that I said, okay, well, if I can do it for any epsilon, then I'm happy, but there won't be a, uh, like there, there, there's no guarantee that there will be like a proof system that's based on the epsilon that, okay, as I keep making epsilon smaller, I know what the certificate needs to be, right? Um, for all I know, for every different epsilon, I will have a completely different proof. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it doesn't help in a certain okay, yeah, way. Yeah, I just wonder whether the statement of the conjecture is allowing or not allowing, yeah. But that, that I don't know, but Sidorenko is here, so. <laughs> Maybe maybe he can tell us. <laughs> so so this was the sum of squares part. So now I have a few more minutes. I just want to tell you very briefly about the tropicalization part, which we use for the rational sum of squares. You have like ten or fifteen minutes, so don't rush. Oh really? Yes. Okay, I thought there was just five more minutes. You talked in our seminar before, yeah. We... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll take my time. Thanks. So, um, so a tool that turned out to be helpful both to think about rational sums of squares and for simplifying the graph profile is tropicalization. So you remember we have this closure of all the vectors of, uh, that record densities of some list of small graphs within target graphs G. And this was this complicated shape that really in general, we have no idea how terrible it can be. So one idea to simplify it is to tropicalize it. So how do I do that? So for any point within my graph profile, I'm going to take its log. And by that, I'm going to take the log of every single uh, component. And so, you know, I can take it in whatever base that I want. And so the tropicalization or the logarithmic set of uh, my graph profile is going to be taking the limit of this log function for all the points in a base one over k as k goes to zero. And so this is kind of, you know, if you've never touched tropicalization, this can be, takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around it. But so we proved that it's actually kind of nicer and easier we showed that the tropicalization of the graph profile is really just the closure of the convex hull of just simple log, whatever base you want, of your graph profile. And so it's a closed cone and is determined by linear inequalities. 
And what are we keeping? Are we simplifying too much or are we keeping anything interesting? Well, we're keeping the binomial inequalities that are valid on your graph profile. So I'm not trying to understand all polynomial inequalities, which maybe anyway would not be giving me the graph profile. I don't know. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the binomial inequalities that are valid on my graph profile. This means uh, polynomials with two monomials, right? With two monomials, yeah. Including constant, I mean, just two monomials. Yeah, exactly. So for example, right, this was our graph profile for an edge and a triangle. And so I had this curve here that was that the homomorphism density of an edge cubed minus the triangle density squared was greater or equal to zero. And so, well, what this becomes is just three times the log of my edge density minus two times the log of my triangle density. I should have a greater or equal to zero there. And so it becomes this inequality here. So I went from this complicated shape to just this very nice, simple cone. And it might really seem as though I'm losing too much, but what I'm retaining are the binomials. And a lot of problems in extremal graph theory are about binomials. So this is not you know, a terrible thing. We're still keeping things that one might actually really do care about. So before going into rational squares, I, I just want to say this is a really fascinating object and I think it's very interesting to study by itself. Um, so for example, you know, whereas for graph profiles, you know, even with three uh, graphs, we had no idea what it should look like. Here we can have graph profiles in however many dimensions um, and have some descriptions. So if I look at a list of graphs containing, you know, all complete graphs up to some size, then I can actually characterize the tropicalization in that case. And really all it comes down to is cross calcatona inequality. So the cross calcatona uh, binomials, which says that the density of a complete graph on P vertices to the power Q minus the homomorphism density of a Q vertex complete graph to the power P is greater or equal to zero when P is smaller than Q. Uh, these are the important binomials plus the fact that a single edge, that homomorphism density of a single edge is at most one. This will give you all binomials that you could uh, ever want to. And so the way we show that is by uh, showing that the extreme rays coming from these inequalities are all realizable. So the extreme rates, for example, if L is equal to five, if I have an edge triangle, K4 and K5, these are the extreme rays. And um, I can realize those. I can show you which graphs live on them. And this is it. Um, so any valid binomial inequality involving complete graphs is implied by cross calcatona inequalities. And the fact that an edge is the density of an edge is at most one. And so I can do it for complete hypergraphs and stars and hyperstars. And Avi, you have a question. Yeah, uh, just to understand what you mean by allowing only binomials. Uh, one thing is that uh, what you want to prove is a binomial inequality. Yes. And the other is never allowing in your sum of squares anything beyond binomial. Is this oh, no, within my sum of squares, I, I can have anything. And so right now, I'm, I'm not actually trying to certify these inequalities in any way. Uh, I'm really just try talking about the trapezoidalization. But my, my sums of squares for binomial, to, for, to prove a binomial inequality, I am not restricting what my sum of squares looks like. Isn't it the case that the reason it's easier is because binomials inequalities behave nicely under uh, sum of squares? So actually, I mean, we, we do show that uh, to prove binomials, you, you can actually, you, you actually can restrict to binomials yeah. <laughs> uh, in this case. Binomial axioms, if your yeah. axioms are binomial. Yeah, so it, it does it, it does work out, but uh, but yeah, we, we we don't care about this here, right? We just actually I'm not trying to certify anything here. I'm just talking about the trapezoidalization object. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. I thought I thought you did want to show that like at least it characterized exactly by what what follows from the Kruskal Katona inequalities. To do yes. That, so that. here I'm talking about I there's a graph profile uh, for, let's say, 
an edge triangle K4 and K5. I don't know what it looks like. And now I'm trying to understand what its tropicalization looks like. And so I'm saying, okay, well, certainly I know it's going to be contained within the cone formed by the cross color ketone inequalities. And K2 is smaller or equal to one because these are true binomial inequalities. Mm -hmm. So I know that my tropicalization has to live within that. There might be binomial inequalities that I'm not thinking of that mm -hmm. I'm missing. Uh, but then I can show that I'm not missing anything because all of the extreme rays of that cone are realizable. I can find graphs that live on those rays. And right now I'm, I'm not talking about sums of squares at all. I'm just saying that there's this big complicated object called a, the graph profile and which we really don't understand, but the tropicalization is easier to understand oftentimes. Any more questions? Um, again, with the, with the Cresco Katona inequalities, I don't think I got it. Oh, so the Cresco Katona inequalities are these famous inequalities that we didn't prove, right? They, they were proven before. That says that the homomorphism density of a clique of size p to the power q uh -oh. minus the homomorphism density of a clique of, power, of size q to the power of p is greater or equal to zero whenever p is smaller than q. Oh, I see. That's it. Okay. I, That's I it. You. The second arrow, I, I was confused by that. Okay, I get you. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, and they're, they're valid binomial inequalities, which is why we know that certainly our tropicalization uh, needs to be within uh, their intersection. Yeah. Okay, so, so the tropicalization allows us to simplify these complicated objects while keeping some interesting inequalities. Um, so, for example, there's the Elder Simonovitz conjecture uh, about paths that says, and so here it's in terms of number of homomorphisms, not densities. So the number of homomorphisms of a path of length T, so with T edges to the power S is greater or equal to the number of homomorphism of a path with S edges to the power T for S and T odd, T greater or equal to S. And so it was open for quite a while. Uh, we didn't know, but uh, Maritz Aglam had proven it already in 2018 in a different ways. But by looking at the tropicalization of uh, when you consider paths, we were able to show that this holds in a very easy way. So right, and so then uh, I don't know. You said that tropicalization may lose things, and uh, but here you say that formed the, the I don't know the truth of this conjecture in the tropical sense. It follows also for the originals. So because this is a binomial. Right, so my tropicalization keeps binomials, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So I can understand all binomials involving paths. And I can, you know, hear what this is saying is I can understand all binomials involving uh, the homomorphism densities of, um, of complete graphs. So you, you can infer as Bohr's theorem about the shape of the pair, edges and triangles from the you know, this picture in the tropical uh, things, which was much simpler. I mean, one can prove as both theorem by doing it in the tropical world and then going back. Yeah. But why wasn't it done? I mean, it seemed like, oh, can it be done? Well, yeah, I mean, so if, if Mert hadn't done it before us, we would have been the first to do it. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it, it can be done that, you know, you can understand the tropicalization and bring it back to the world of uh, just graph homomorphisms, that's, that's not a problem. So yeah, um, I'm just uh, trying to, that uh, seems like a major uh, simplification. I mean- It is uh, a major simplification, yes. So you just, uh, in the case, forget Kruskal, Katona and everything, just two graphs, you have edges and triangles. You go to the tropical world and you have the simple triangle you showed us. Yeah. Yeah, if you prove that, uh, yeah, I mean, the extreme rays, uh, you know, are, are uh, there, they follow from the, you know, very easy version of Oscar Carton, I guess, Mantello. Uh, so you um, get the, con the convex half of, of uh, Rosbaugh's shape this way. You can only prove linear inequalities. Yeah, so, 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 right. So binomials, binomials in the world of graph homomorphisms want to tropicalize always become linear inequalities, like Yuval was just saying, right? And so, and that's fine, right? So 
here, you know, you're, you're, you're going to get these inner inequalities. Yeah. And so, um, uh, yeah, so anything, so here you can see that any binomial inequality involving uh, an edge and a triangle uh, densities will be coming from either this, uh, this three, two guy or this zero minus one guy. So all the, you know, this uh, ragged uh, boundary on the right is en encapsulated here. No, because these are not binomials. Ah, so you don't get the Hasbov result. I mean, the Hasbov result. You, you was, do not get the Hasbov no, result. No, I mean, yeah, of course, the hard part was to certify the, the right yeah. side, the, the right boundary. Oh, so yeah, no, I completely yeah, agree. You, yeah, okay. So, you so, so, so in, in this case, you know, there, there's no... There, there, there was no open uh, question about any binomials in the case of just having edges and triangles, okay. right? But so, for example, uh, in the case of paths, there was, right? So it, it, it wasn't known whether this binomial inequality hold. Um, and so then by studying the tropicalization, you know, uh, you can really understand all binomials if you're able to actually fully describe the tropicalization. So what you need of the original uh profile is that all its boundary uh, curves or whatever they are, uh, surfaces will be described by binomials. Well, it's I don't need that all of them needs to be described by binomials. It's just that what I'm going to keep from it are its binomials inequalities. Right? So like, I mean, it's completely fine that here there are things that are not described by binomials. It's just I'm going to forget about it. Forget about it. Uh, what is the meaning of forgetting about it? That you can uh, prove that the prove that the. Uh, I, I won't be able to uh, prove anything about the things that are not binomials in the original pictures. Okay. So I, I could relax this picture and just say, uh, look at all the points that uh, you know satisfy some binomial inequalities, and I would get something bigger. Mm -hmm. And so really, that's what I'm keeping this relaxation. I see. What would it look like in this uh, in this case? So it would look like uh, basically, I think the, the full thing below this curve. Okay. Sorry, and I also oh. Tony, please. Yeah, this is another actually not smart question. But so, so when you do the tropicalization, do you get exactly the same? You get exactly the same thing as if you were to that restrict SOS to binomial. Inequality? Uh, not not SOS, and that's a good question, actually. Uh, so maybe maybe some of the squares cannot actually do all binomials, right? So I'm I'm getting something better than oh. maybe maybe I can do it with some some of the squares or not. But I'm actually going to kind of address this question in a second, mm -hmm. though I am really over time already. Uh, but I know you guys are funny questions. about this. Yeah, it happens when you get lots of questions. It's okay. So let's uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, I mean, if anybody needs to go, I will not be offended. Um, so going to Tony's question. So, okay. So in certain cases, Greg and I have been able to, you know, fully explain what tropicalizations of graph profiles will look like. But in general, we don't know how to do that. We, we know it's going to be a closed convex cone, which is much simpler than the graph profile, but we don't necessarily know in all cases how to do it but we can use sums of squares to approximate it. So what we do is we kind of look at the dual of sums of squares. So we look at uh, B, which is a partially labeled graphs whose square have at most the edges and at least one label um, with the empty graph. And then I look at the moment matrix of these uh, partially labeled graphs where the AB entry is going to be the symmetrization of A times B. And so then really for any PSA matrix Q, uh, the product of M and Q is going to be a graph sum of squares of the graph most D, right? So we're kind of looking at duality there. And so now I can look at the SOS profile of degree D. So by that, I mean, I'll look at all points that um, when evaluated by M, I get a PSD matrix. And I can even relax that. So I can look only at the points that will make the two by two principal minors greater or equal to zero. So for this SOS profile, I'm looking for all principal minors to be greater or equal to zero, but I could relax that and say, I only want the two by two principal minors. 
So I have that my graph profile sits within my sum of squares profile, right? So the sum of squares profile is what I can prove with SOS. Uh, so, you know, which is maybe not everything. So I, I'm, I'm going to be bigger than my graph profile, maybe. And then, okay, what if I only <laughs> have this two by two minors that need to be uh, greater or equal to zero? So then I'm even bigger. And so now I can tropicalize all of these objects, right? We talked about the tropicalization of um, the graph profile, but I can tropicalize uh, SD. And so the very nice thing is that the tropicalization of my SOS profile is actually just the logarithm of my two by two relaxation. So it's a polyhedral rational cone, which is nice because I didn't know that about the tropicalization of my graph profile. And I know exactly, you know, uh, what it is given by, it's determined by the two by two determinant principal minors. So I'm able to fully describe what a tropicalization of my SOS uh, profile is always. And so this allows me to approximate my um, the tropicalization of my graph profile. And so this is what we use to do the rational sum of squares part is we said, okay, look at some, um, some binomial inequality involving uh, graph densities. And so if I had that this was not a valid inequality on my relaxation, then that meant that there exists some point within my, that was accepted by my sum of squares, such that my binomial evaluate on it is smaller than zero. And then that tells you that you cannot have a rational sum of squares because otherwise, if I did have a rational sum of squares, I knew that there would exist some uh, sum of squares B and some sum of squares C such that A times B is equal to C. But I know that V, that point V is in my SS profile. So B evaluated on V and C evaluated on V has to be greater or equal to zero. So I would have A smaller than zero and B and C greater or equal to zero, that doesn't work. So really, you know, like, so the, the tropicalization of the sum of squares profile is nice in two ways. It helps us to understand better tropicalization of graph profile when we don't know it, but it also allows us to talk about rational sums of squares and show examples where uh, it cannot be done. So I'm way over time, so uh, let's conclude and then we can talk more for those who want to talk more. So what are some takeaways? Uh, so homogeneity is a weakness for both sums of squares and rational sums of squares, and it's even more than homogeneity. It's the lowest degree part. You know, there's all these restrictions that come there. Um, and so because of that, you know, for certain homogeneous problems in extremal graph theory, uh, like Sidorenko's conjecture, sums of squares might not be the best tool, or at least, you know, uh, it's hard to, you know, certainly for Sidorenko's conjecture, we know it cannot uh, be used to prove it fully, uh, but so there, there's a weakness there, and it would be surprising that is what need what is needed in general for such problems. Um, but on the flip side, the tropicalization is a very useful object to study valid binomial inequalities. And so we do want to understand this tropicalization of the graph profile better, right? So we don't know if it's always a rational polyhedral cone. Um, so every example that we found is, uh, we've thought about it for other objects who are trying to understand what are the properties there. So for matroids, for example, yes, it is. Uh, for simplicial complex complexes, it is. Uh, but so for, for graphs in general, we, we don't know. And so this would tie to a uh, question about uh, decidability, right? So uh, Hamed and Sake showed that not all, uh, that the, the problem of the validity of uh, polynomial inequalities involving graph densities is undecidable in general. But is the same true for a pure binomial inequality? We don't know. And so if this was always a polyhedral cone, then it would be a decidable problem. Um, we would like to find an example of a non-negative graph polynomial that is not a sum of squares, but that is a rational sum of squares. So we don't know of any such examples. We don't know that rational sums of squares are actually stronger than uh, sums of squares in this world. And then, you know, uh, there are other certificates of non-negativity, right? Uh, like uh, the sums of non-negative circuits, 
And so they might be interesting um, to provide certificates for non-negative graph polynomials in the cases where some of those curves are weak. All right, so I will stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, so great. Uh, questions to Ami. Any. Uh, I don't think it's right to call that uh, inequality for Peth uh, the Black Lay Roy inequality. Because, oh, that's true. Uh, we had this yeah, conversation. Six I years think. earlier, it was proved by two groups of others. That, that is true. I mean, it's, it's what the literature calls it in general, but. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to right. find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right that we should uh, give it another name. <laughs> Can you explain what these SLNCs are? So sums of non-negative circuits is a method that relies on relative entropy. Um, so different people have worked on it. Um, so there's a group with Timo de Wolf and uh, Mahaike Tresla uh, who have been working hard on creating a solver for it and um, in the past few years, but it's been around for a longer time too. And I think Cynthia probably knows better than me uh, who started songs, maybe. <laughs> but <laughs> do some of the um... so all of the graph densities are in zero one, right? And if you were doing just straight up sums of squares, you would start allowing multipliers of just like multipliers of the variables or multipliers of like one minus the variables. Yeah. Is that sort of built in when you say sum of squares? That yeah. is built in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess I don't know if there's a sunk analog of uh, multipliers like that. Yeah, I mean, socks are different. I mean, I'm still, uh, I mean, that's why that's a future direction. I haven't started working on them, but <laughs> uh, I, I do think that they're interesting just because there are so many problems um, in extremal graph theory that entropy was important in their proofs. And so this is a method built around entropy. So it feels as though maybe uh, they would be better adapted than some of those squares. And uh, like Timo and his team have these results where, you know, they show that the cones of uh, sums of squares and songs, you know, they intersect, but they're not the same. So you cover more ground, uh, but they do that for real polynomials, right? So that machinery hasn't been applied to uh, graph densities. Uh, can I go to Yuval's question in the beginning? Uh, what happens when you try to tropicalize the uh, edges versus the square? I mean, edge versus a square density for which you don't know the, we don't know the, um, profile. So we haven't tried edge and square. Um, so I think understanding paths, so, so we're almost done understanding paths fully. So we, we, we have this result, we have other results for paths, we have a conjecture about what the tropicalization is and we're very close to proving it fully. But so um, I think in the past, people have tried to understand paths before trying to understand cycles, because cycles you can see as two mm -hmm. paths put together. Uh, so simplest with a cycle. Yeah, but paths are already very complicated compared to complete graphs and stars, for example. More questions. All right, Annie, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.